What's up? I'm, I'm in the next part. Um, yes, he. Uh. Whoops. All of this work that I'm doing, it's unfortunate. Don't nobody look at it, sister. Shame. Like, literally, not for me, but for you. Kiss on. Because my ministry is, ironically, for the very people who broke me, to the type of people who broke me. And so, because it is for, ironically, the type of people who broke me, they are least likely to listen to me. That's how God handles people sometimes, hey? And people that hate me because they hurt me will struggle to listen to me. But I am unraveling discoveries and revelations that God is giving me concerning how they can come to Him. So, in the absence of listening to me, they're in trouble. My mind is a very particularly focused targeted ministry for certain types of people and not everybody's given that kind of ministry you might not feel edified by hopping from pastor to pastor who is preaching a very edifying message because of the very of the particular issue that you're facing the demonic peril that you are in that you are immersed in and the very victim that you subjugated to tyranny that you can't stand to listen to her voice when she speaks it sounds like a monster speaking or you can't stand me because I sound like a squeaky little girl. You can't stand the sound of my voice because I am the person you've made an enemy. It just so happens to be the only one that can actually help you get out of the darkness. And uh, I forget what psalm it is, but David describes such people as those who are wrongfully my foes. You've made yourselves my enemies wrongfully. I've done nothing to you, if anything, in the days of your sorrow. I wore sackcloth and ashes and I fasted and I prayed for you. And you've made out of me an enemy wrongfully. So much so have you been made yourself at enmity with me that you can't listen to the only source of counsel that is as deeply reaching of your particular concern as I deliver because it's me talking. You've made it hard for you guys to listen to me. You've closed your own ears. You've put plugs in your own ears because it's me that's talking. You can't stand me because you've made yourselves enemies of me wrongfully. I was supposed to be your friend. So those of you who can humble yourselves and put your tail between your legs and listen to everything that I have to say that God is prophesying through me, maybe you stand a chance. But the rest of y'all, go to call to Paul Washer. Go to Vody Bakum. Go to John Piper. Go to like uh, uh, Stephen Lawson. Go even listen to Charles Spurgeon, the Puritan archives. Go and listen to uh, who's this Oki um, that I really respect the, the the work of. I forgot his name. He just escaped me. Go and listen to all of these pastors all over the show that are very sound, biblically voracious. Go listen to uh, uh, I didn't know who's this Chuck Missler. Go and listen he the late Chuck Missler, David Wilkerson, the late. David Wilkerson, go and listen to any of these pastors that I would recommend to anyone, any day. Maybe even go listen to Timothy Alberino because he's got like a, quite an interesting, you know, offbeat vantage point in terms of the of eschatology, and he's worth a while to listen to. Go and listen to all of these worthwhile sound guys and see if you still feel if if you feel reached or if you feel like you can get out of what you're in. There are certain people that have been made specialists in the faith, guys. You know, like with any uh, profession within the medical sciences, there are specialists, there are nutritionists, there are psychiatrists, there are neurologists, there are um, podiatrists within one field, medicine. And so if you've got an, uh, an issue with the foot, you can go to a GP, but you are better off going to a podiatrist. So I am a specialist in the thing that you guys are involved in. That's what I'm trying to explain to you guys. You can go to a general practitioner, a preacher that's just going to, you know, from beginning to end, just cover stuff. Like a preacher like Paul Washer for me in the faith is a, is a, is a GP. He's a general practitioner. He generally covers the most important things that you need for the faith. Alan Parr was who it is that I wanted to speak about. Alan Parr is also a general practitioner. You'll get reached and edified if you're a Christian, but there are people who are in dire need of specialists. They need deliverance ministers. They need a little bit of a Derek Prince. They need an Isaiah Salvador. They need somebody who is focused on prophecy, in, but like something, someone that is going to be able to basically get to the heart of what they're dealing with. They need people who are also, for instance, ex-witches that have repented. A little bit of a John Ramirez will likely better help someone that is coming out of the occult than, like I said, a Paul Washer, who is a general practitioner. As Stephen Bankars is not a GP, he is good at bringing people out from the mm, mm, new age and the occult. M Melissa Doherty is excellent at bringing people out of the new age and the occult because she used to be in that space. She's a, a specialist. She's not a GP. So you guys can go to GPs as much as you want. They're excellent in the faith. If anything, I was rescued largely by GPs because I wasn't a witch. 
I was rescued by general practitioner pastors, but there are people who need specialists. I have only become a specialist because I'm a victim of witches. So God has particularly focused my ministry on sorcery. So I get a lot of vis visions and dreams that have a lot to do with sorcery. And I expand on them and exposit on these experiences. And people who have been entangled in the darkness will likely get freed from the rubbish that they're in by someone like me more than they will listening to a GP Christian. So since you have afflicted me so badly you will struggle to listen to me oh witches but understand that i've been made a practitioner just for you so either humble yourself and allow yourself to listen to me or stay in a dingy little corner hoping that you can somehow navigate the bible on your own not only is the bible rough to read for a person that's never been saved however never dabbled it's ever more so rough to read by the occult because some of y'all people in the occult use the scriptures to do incantations so you can't read the scriptures properly. You need somebody that is not going to be all scholastic about it, like a little bit of a hermeneutical, exegetical, like theological seminary trainer of the scriptures. You need someone that's going to be able to under, not so much understand, but explain the scriptures to you in a way that you will understand in your baby language, in your ones and twos, ABCs language. And sometimes that does not mean theological seminary. It means helping people in the darkness to understand what certain scriptures mean. Paul Washer will explain the Beatitudes to you in a very seminary way, but the Beatitudes will be explained to you by someone that has either been saved from the occult or that has been dealing with witchcraft for a very long amount of time in a way that is, you know, differently reaching to people of a particular cloth, people who walk in a particular sin. God, it is written in his word that he knows how to reach, uh, can he save the righteous for himself. God knows how to rescue his lost sheep. He knows how to bring them to the fold. Not every beautiful, excellent preacher is going to reach every lost man and woman on the street. But some preachers or some teachers, some evangelists will reach others better than others because of the style of preaching that they've got. All right. So if you did not respond to Joe Kirby on the street as an evangelist, you might listen to me. But witches can't stand me. They literally can't deal because I am so hammery downy on this dark stuff. And it, they can't stand. Y'all hate the living daylights out of me. But you are unlikely going to get reached by you might get reached by joe kirby he's really great but you 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 know he's he's soft he's gentle i love his his um his his preaching style he's just really gifted he knows how to not offend while still being biblically sound so joe kirby might work for you actually flat to him witches but if all else fails will joe kirby come to me i'm just saying anyway the next part of my dream because yeah i ain't done it was that intense we went from the suicide guy here it is that i'm stranded in this little corner okay i'm freaking out my heart is writhing i think i'm gonna die indeed i believe this lens over to y'all who have dabbled in the occult but you're not too far gone whoever i was in my dream was somebody who had compromised themselves by taking one step in the wrong direction but then i felt scared but i was arrested in this fear guess who saved me i was remember holding on to some water feature and I was freaking out on some, oh my goodness, what's going on? Oh my goodness, what's going on? I didn't even pray to Jesus. I'm a Christian in waking life. In this dream, I didn't pray to Christ. I would have automatically prayed to Christ in waking life. But the fact that I was in this metropolis in the first place evidence is that I probably wasn't who I am in waking life. Because I wouldn't even dare attempt to join the satanic agenda. I wouldn't even try. Would, I'm not lurable. I am not lurable. I'm not temptable. Okay, maybe I might be. Let me not call myself perfect. Do not think you stand lest you should fall. But I am not attracted to this agenda. Like, I'm not even in the slightest am I tempted to compromise myself in that way. So whoever I was, I'm a person. I was likely a person in this dream that probably dabbled with some occult stuff but felt uncomfortable and then they got like arrested in one particular position. I didn't even pray to God. But guess what? I was snatched out. You know how the scriptures say, if it is possible, snatch some even from the flames of hell by these Christian students. They were students like kids. And by students, I'm not even speaking university level. They look like they could be in high school. I was rescued by Christian students. And you know, it's ironic because recently there's been this um, revival. They call it a revival in some university in the US called Asbury. I was snatched out by, by some what looked like high school kids, but they could have been university age, but they were that young. They looked like teenagers, a bunch of boys. And they reached a hand out. It was so easy for them to take me out of that dip. Like I would have imagined they would have needed lots of like, you know, muscle strength, but no. One of them saw me in this compromised state and just reached out a hand and just took me out. It's like I was in a puddle of water. Meanwhile, I was thinking I was drowning in an ocean. He just like, yeah. And I was out sitting next to them. I was so grateful that I started to develop a crush on the dude that took me out. 
he was preachy. He was like a little street evangelist boy. And he kept on talking about Jesus. He was quoting so much scripture, you know, almost in a rappy kind of fashion. It's like he was a, an MC. And I, I, was, I, I, I started to develop a crush on him because he was so cool to me. He was so cool and he knew the scripture so well. But then when I looked at his face, he was so young. And in my dream, I then just like, I remembered that I'm 38. I remember that I'm 38 and I instantly got disappointed and crushed in my spirit that I was a 38 year old woman busy crushing on what looked like a 17, 18 year old boy. This boy did not have a crush on me. But I had a crush on him and I got over myself in that crush because of the fact that I was an old woman for that little boy, right? But him and his boys just took me out of that little place and I found myself fellowshipping with them. Now, these students, these boys had, they were walking because they were not part, they were not of the system. So the scriptures say that we are in this world, but we're not of it. They were not of the system, but they were in it. I was scared of this place because everywhere that I tried to walk, I felt like I was going to fall to my demise. These boys, however, were walking in it with boldness. They were walking in this metropolis that was so full of sorcery and darkness and evil and wickedness and people gliding all over the show. They were walking with a bravado and a boldness and they kept on talking to everyone in this metropolis saying to them, come with us, we need to get out. I know the way out. These boys were telling everybody, I know the way out. We need to go through this particular mall. And at the end of this mall is an exit out of this metropolis. And you guys need to follow us out of this because this whole metropolis is going to crash and burn. They were warning everybody that the metropolis was going to c crash and burn. Like an earthquake was going to hit something cataclysmic. Like of a natural disaster scoop was going to hit. And this thing was going to fall in one sitting. And these boys were going all over the show. And I made a decision in my dream that where these these boys go I go I'm sorry I sound like aka right now I said I told myself in my dream that I'm gonna hold on to these kids they were so young guys as as the journey continued in this dream and I'm, I'm gonna explain it to you they got so young some of them were even like toddlers they were like pre-teens they were like just uh, like barely out of crawling and they were walking and they were the ones that were basically shouting the message to everybody to get out of this metropolis and guess what people were believing them people were believing them here are these teenage boys got me out of that rut. They start to preach to everybody. Get out of this, it's gonna fall. And we know the way out of this. We, you have to take the way that is through this mall. And this going through this mall is the only way out. There's no other exit out of this metropolis other than through this mall. There was a mall that linked this metropolis, this city, this raccoon city to the outside world. Oh, you know, that, that was not very attractive to people because people there were struggling. And these boys were like, we need to get out of this because this whole structure is gonna fall. And I made a decision that where these boys go, I'm going and I'm not letting go of them. I felt silly and old. I felt like in go to. I felt like, um, what do you call this? Uh, an elderly woman just busy hanging around children. I, I felt uncomfortable, but I put my tail between my legs. I humbled myself and accepted guidance by children because I understood them to be right. And the reason why I trusted them was because they managed to get me out of a rut that nobody else was able to get me out of. And they were busy saying, get out of this. Everybody's going to be in trouble. And I told myself that even though they're just kids, I'm going to trust them. And I followed them. Next part so you can hear the rest of the dream.